I wanted to offer also um, offer my personal welcome to you all and say that for me at least, uh, this has been four years in the making. I remember coming very soon after uh, I came, came as chief scientist to the Met Office in 2009, realizing that World Climate Conference 3 was coming along and that there is, uh, there would be a recommendation around climate services. And uh, with John's support, we began to think what that might mean for us as the Met Office and for us in partnership with our uh, major collaborators such as uh, the Natural Environment Research Council and the Environment Agency. And uh, I should say a personal thanks to Chris Hewitt who is hiding at the back of the room because without him I doubt we would be here today and in such good shape. He sat alongside me as we thought this through and he also spent a large amount of time assisting Jerry's team in WMO to develop the implementation plan for the global framework for climate services. So thank you, Chris. Um, it is a landmark day in a sense that we're recognizing today that the science of climate, not just climate change, but climate variability as well, is reaching that level of maturity that we can make it work for the good of society. Um, it's just over 20 years since Sir John Horton had the vision to create the Met Office Hadley Center to address then the urgent question of was the climate warming and if so for what reason and I think we have some pretty solid answers to that 20 years on. It's now about doing something about it and what we've learned along the way that is that it's not just about climate change because actually as a society we are so much more exposed, so much more vulnerable than we were even 20 years ago, that actually there is a real need to understand climate variability itself. Even without climate change, I would argue we would need climate services. So it is a landmark day for us. It's the beginning of a long journey. We have lots of fundamental science still to do. What we did four years ago when we saw this path that we needed to take coming before us was to say, well, what do we need to do about our science base? And we undertook, even in these last four years, a very determined effort to move from global <coughs> climate scenarios to start to think about the regional ramifications, not just of climate change, but of natural climate variability. We've driven a very focused path along understanding processes and phenomena in our climate <coughs> models, increasing the resolution and, and improving the degree to which we can predict on monthly, seasonal and decadal timescales. So I think four years on, our science is coming into shape to address these challenges. So now it is the time, to, as it says, to work together to prepare for tomorrow. We've already heard from Jerry what the challenges are that we face as a society, managing our water, protecting our cities, feeding the world. We know that we're massively more exposed than we were. And Sir John Beddington, the former uh, government chief scientist, often talked about the perfect storm. And he talked about it maybe in 2030, 2040, 2050. I would argue that we're already seeing these challenges now. Look at New York and Hurricane Sandy. Look at uh, our own difficulties in managing our water not that long ago, a year and a bit ago. Look at the challenges of feeding the world, um, that we know the impacts of the Russian heat wave, of the US drought on food prices, and the ability of less well-off countries to buy and import the food resources that they need so urgently. So these are not challenges for a few, few decades away. They're challenges for here and now. I would also say that we are taking the planet into uncharted territory. I'm not going to give a lecture on climate change science, but anybody <coughs> who follows at all the records going back over 800,000 years knows that CO2 is now far higher than it's been for a very long time. CO2 is a potent greenhouse gas um, and temperatures will rise. We're already in the warm cycle of, uh, of the glacial interglacial cycles 
and therefore we are truly taking this planet into <coughs> uncharted territory and very rapidly at a pace that many systems, natural systems, will find hard to adjust to. And so there are some very, very serious questions to answer. Um, and if we as a society are going to manage the challenges that rapid climate change will throw at us, then we do need to provide society with, as I call it, a roadmap of all the things that can help us to mitigate the damaging effects, take advantage of some aspects of climate variability and change. It's not all a bad news story. Um, and um, allow society to grow and prosper in what will be a very challenging uh, decades ahead as we come to terms with what we've already done to the planet and what we may still be yet do, do in the coming decades. Jerry's already covered my slide, um, so I don't need to go through that. I had a feeling that Jerry and I would be on one voice on this. And um, I've just added a few words and changed a few words here. But I wanted to emphasize one thing, and that it is, um, in a sense, we don't feel the climate. We feel the weather. And what we feel specifically is hazardous weather. And I suppose I could talk about climate extremes, which I mean years of drought, years of flood, those sorts of things. And so it is an absolute imperative that we begin to couch our message in terms of these sorts of uh, phenomena. We move away from talking about global mean temperature. It's a meaningless concept to most people. It's handy for the politicians if you're negotiating carbon levels and things like that. But for most people, this is not where, how we get across, we should be getting across our message. So we urgently need to start talking in a more sophisticated way about what climate change is really about and what a two degree world could look like. And I believe there's also a sense of urgency around climate services. Um, we are beginning to see many more extremes. Jerry's talked about this already. Here's just a few. Uh, in the last two, three years, some of them are very close to home. Some of them are a bit further away, but we feel their effects. We live in a global society. <coughs> We're massively interdependent. So disasters in other parts of the world are just as important to us as to the people that feel them. And in the UK, we are all very well aware of uh, the very damaging effects of last year's heavy rainfall. We think about our own food security and the damage that that has done and continues to do to our agricultural systems in this country. We need to be able to anticipate these sorts of events. We need to be able to make ourselves more resilient, more better prepared, and indeed think about wise ways of adapting to what the future may bring. So lots of very challenging science, but of course what you can also see on that, that it's, just not, it's not just the weather that causes the problem. The weather and the climate are often the, the, are the prime driver but many of the effects are mediated through other systems, other parts of the environment, flooding through hyd hydrology, uh, the impacts on our own uh, energy systems, on our food supply, so on and so forth. So this is not just a problem for people like me, a meteorologist. This is a problem for all of us. And so when we think about a climate service, it has to be thought of as an end-to-end -end delivery chain from science to service. We cannot partition it up into chunks. We are part of a single food chain, as I often describe it, <coughs> where you could say that the national climate capability, which is embodied by the Met Office Hadley Centre and our partners in uh, NERC and the uh, universities are at the far end of that, the core research, the prediction and climatologies. That's our core business, and we have still masses to do there. But to make these things useful, we need to call on translational science, the sorts of science that hydrologists do, that crop scientists do, many, many examples of the sorts of translational science we need. 
And then let's not forget the technology, because the other thing that I think is transforming our world is not just the sophistication of the climate science that we can now bring to bear, but the fact that we can deliver information, what I call informatics, in so many exciting ways through web, through mobile phones, through all sorts of technologies that can reach every person virtually in the world if we shape them in the right way. So let's not forget the service development, the service delivery. And of course, at the far end of that is the customer. And the customer could be a farmer in Africa, it could be a senior manager in EDF, it could be Joe on the street in London. There are all sorts of people we need to understand what causes them pain. What do they worry about? What are the things that <coughs> the, the knowledge that we have that would make a difference to what they do? And sometimes it may not be avoiding disaster. It may sometimes be about growing a business, contributing more effectively to the economy. And although that looks like a unilateral thing, and if I'd had my time again, I would have drawn another arrow going back. This is actually about dialogue. The climate service must be about dialogue. It must be about, first and foremost, listening to the customer and assessing what they need. We've had a wonderful program with DFID, I can see Van here, um, on Africa and climate variability. And the first thing we did was to go out and speak to 50 uh, centers around Africa, groups of users, find out what it was that really bothered them and what they really wanted to know. And it was transformational to our science. It posed a whole load of new questions for us. We had to go back to the beginning and do some core research to really make sure that what we were spending our time on in investing often in many years of research is going to be relevant by the time <coughs> it gets to the customer. We've talked about the various sorts of products and services, and I realize I'm running through time quite quickly. Just want to give you a flavor of the sorts of things we, we now need to do. The first thing, of course, is we need to understand our current climate and where our current climate is in the context of what we've experienced in the past. Are things really changing, or is it just the way we live that's causing us problems? And this is the sort of thing that increasingly we have to do. And this is an example of ex extreme daily rainfall statistics for the UK. And although um, I would not say this was a statistically significant result, and I certainly wouldn't with the current um, bashing I'm getting from statisticians, nevertheless, you look at that and you say there is emerging evidence here that extreme rainfall in the UK on a daily basis is increasing. And that has huge implications if you're talking about flood defences, you're talking about flash flooding, you're talking about drain design, all the things that concern DEFRA and the Environment Agency, highly relevant. We need to keep our observations, our monitoring really up to date and relevant. I also wanted to say that in fact we don't do climate services in isolation. For us, at least in the UK, they are going, it will be strongly rooted in our national weather service, in our public weather services, which we've learned how to uh, deliver those <coughs> over many decades. And the point is that we sit, the science that we do and the technology sits on the shoulders of our public weather service. This isn't a climate service. This is a red alert for flooding over the southwest last year on the... Your left is a forecast and the observations. It's a remarkable forecast. Um, and it allowed the, a lot of action to be taken by emergency providers. But why can't that technology be used to tell us about the risk of severe flooding in the future? We have the Flood Forecasting Centre, a fantastic partnership with the Environment Agency and the Met Office to help us... Um, be more resilient and prepared to flooding today, but the same science and, in, and the same modeling, the same technology can inform us about flood risk in the future. So these are the sorts of things that climate services will enable us to do. And we have the science and technology in place to tackle these things. Whoops. 
And then, of course, Jerry talked very much about the UK's role in the global community. And it is right that we, as a very sophisticated weather and climate science uh, country, and with uh, fantastic resources in terms of bringing together different sciences, we help develop other countries. And here's just an example of something we're doing with Singapore. And what the photo at the bottom is another point that I wanted to make, that here we are, we have to develop the next generation of young scientists who can operate at this inter oops, interdisciplinary level of sciences, of working with the user, understanding problems. And this is the group of young scientists who we're now working with at Singapore, and in the middle of there are two of our own young scientists. A fantastic example of building capability in a country that so badly needs the sorts of intelligence, the knowledge that we have. So, summary. I think the Climate Service UK is about unlocking the potential that exists in this country, and which we'll hear more about um, in the subsequent presentations. And as I wrote four years ago in the document called Pioneer, which started, I think, our, our road, the road we're taking now, together with our global network of partners across governments, academia, and business, we are uniquely placed to rise to the challenge of creating a climate services that addresses the needs of societies everywhere. And there I was speaking not just for the Met Office, I was speaking, I hoped, for the UK as a whole and for our wider relationship through organisations like the Global Framework for Climate Services. Thank you very much.